There's this shot in the 1997 Berserk anime intro, and it's Guts standing on a cliff. And something about it is just so quiet and sad. Maybe it's the shot's solitary nature, Guts surrounded by nothing but a great blue sky. Maybe it's the way the shot is angled, nearly feeling like at any moment Guts could plunge forward over the edge into the unseen abyss below. But regardless, to me, when I think of Berserk, these are inevitably the moments that come back to me. These beautifully sad and quiet moments. These are really the scenes that give Berserk its heart and soul and separate it from so many other Senin series of this type. It can be something as significant as two people realising their attraction to each other for the first time, or something as subtle as Guts placing the hat back on a little girl. And it's in these scenes that you find the emotional heart of Berserk as a series. It's a story, through all its epic battles, bloodshed and nightmarish imagery, of people, the bonds they form and what can happen when those bonds are broken. Of course, there's more to it than that. A lot more, in fact. Berserk's run in the manga industry is near legendary, and it has become one of the most influential and prolific properties in existence. Chances are, if you've ever seen a sad anime boy holding a large sword, it's taken influence from Berserk. And despite the fact that it has hiatuses that could rival Hunter x Hunter, it's still a much beloved and ongoing series to this day. And the reasons for that is exactly what we're here to talk about. So once again, my friends, let's grab our oversized swords, bear our brands, remember that Griffith did everything wrong, and talk about why you should watch, slash read, Berserk. Berserk began publication in 1988 in the now defunct Monthly Animal House magazine. It told the story of wandering swordsman Guts, or Gatsu as he's known in Japan, and was set in a dark Western European style fantasy world, written and illustrated by the phenomenal Kintaro Mura. I've talked a lot before about how much respect I have for manga authors. I think the work and talent it takes to create even a mediocre manga is immense, but even among the best in the industry, Mura stands on his own. Need some proof? Well, let's check out these pages from Mura's first ever manga, Moranger. Granted, they do lack the refinement and power of Mura's later work, but they're still decent, right? Well, the thing there is that Mora was 10 years old when he drew this. I mean, geez, when I was 10 years old, I was writing terrible Final Fantasy VII fanfiction. Mora was already a published author. Moringer would continue for 40 volumes, but what's fascinating is what came after. And that is the work that Mora would put into improving and refining his already impressive abilities. One of the things that really struck me when going through Mora's old interviews is the emphasis he puts on using reference and influence from outside the manga industry, such as the 19th century artist M.C. Escher. Escher's work is mainly woodcut and lithographs, both extremely work-intensive mediums, but it gives his work this kind of densely layered and detailed feel. And when comparing the two, it's fascinating to see Mora try and recreate this hyper-detailed style with a pen and ink. Mora also draws on unconventional sources to influence his story and writing. While he does take a lot of inspiration from Western-influenced Japanese fantasy such as Gun Saga and early fantasy manga Pygmalio, Mora often cites how he draws equal inspiration from shoujo manga, even suggesting to him that Berserk is more a shoujo manga than anything else. His reasoning being that shonen senen manga tend to go by the rule that logic governs emotion, but with shoujo, emotion governs logic. While I think it's probably a bit of a stretch to try and refer to Berserk as a shoujo, I do think it reveals a fascinating insight into why Mora writes the way he does, and also accounts for those moments of quiet emotion I mentioned earlier. The other major influence of the story is however Mora's own life, and despite claiming to the contrary, I believe Mora very much writes himself as Guts. Mora, like Guts, is very solitary, a fact I learned when I tried to find some footage of Mora drawing. There is barely any photos or footage of the guy in existence, and often in interviews, Mora cites the moment he decided to pull back from his college friends to walk his own path as a key moment in his life which of course draws parallels to key plot events in Berserk. Investing his own experiences in the story like this gives Berserk an authentic emotional appeal, and again does so much to separate it from other Sen in power fantasies. 
It's also these aspects that I think make it particularly difficult to understand exactly what Berserk is if you're unfamiliar with it. Google Berserk and you'll get an avalanche of images of horrific monstrosities and guts looking like a crazy person, which might lead you to believe that Berserk is your typical seinen power fantasy. And you know, in a way, it kind of totally is. A lot of the appeal from Berserk comes from watching a very large man swing a very big sword into very massive monsters. But it's everything that builds on top of this that elevates Berserk so far beyond its contemporaries. And I think this can be best seen in the portrayal of the main character, everyone's favourite Barra Husbandu, Guts. Guts is a character of two sides, one the battle-hungry power fantasy, and the other the shy, awkward giant scared to get close to people. And it's this second layer that makes him such an endearing and interesting protagonist. On the surface, he's the ideal Senin power trip. He has the upper body mass of several large rhinos and the brooding disposition of Batman on a very, very bad day. But where he starts to differ from his muscle-bound brethren is in one very simple area, his vulnerability. Despite Guts' ability to cleave a dinosaur in half, there's always a human element to his character and actions. And a lot of this comes from how incredibly sympathetically he's written. Everything bad that can happen a person has happened Guts, and yes, I do mean everything. An orphan of war, Guts was raised by a cruel mercenary and suffered both physical and emotional abuse, and unfortunately, much, much worse. The experience left Guts emotionally damaged. The only way he knew to express himself was through battle, and hence he became very, very good at it. It's also left Guts cruel and violent. He takes pleasure in hurting his opponents, and he's never happier than when deep into a desperate battle. Interestingly, Mora commented on this before and alluded that his intention with Guts was not to create a traditional hero, but rather describe a character's life in detail and allow people to make up their own minds. And this is the kind of character writing I really love to see in protagonists. Guts' backstory informs every action he makes even the very tiny ones, like this one scene where a soldier tries to give Guts a friendly congratulatory pat on the back, only to have Guts lash out in anger at being touched, or why he's so slow to accept the band of Hawk as his friends. Seeing him trying to overcome his personal demons and learn to accept people again is some of the most rewarding parts of early Berserk, and makes some of the later occurrences nearly obscenely tragic. But this is also not just Guts' story. The world of Berserk contains many different people on their own path, and two of the most prominent early on are Casca and Griffith. And while these are both great characters in their own right, it's the complicated relationship they form with Guts that drives the emotional heart of Berserk. See, Casca is a tough-ass warrior. She's a former peasant saved by Griffith and given the chance to fight which she did very well as she quickly rose through the ranks to become his right hand. Much like Guts, she's very much an outsider, and everything from her gender to her skin tone serves to differentiate her from her peers. But to her, that doesn't really matter, because all Casca really wants is Griffith. And while she does care for Guts, she also comes to quickly disdain him, as Guts quickly becomes Griffith's number two instead. Griffith is the glorious leader of the Band of Hawk, who's the mercenary group who takes Guts in early on in the story. He's a man of both deep empathy and ruthless ambition, and throughout the early chapters of Berserk, we're constantly reminded that there is nothing Griffith won't do to obtain what he considers his rightful destiny. And this only becomes more complicated when Griffith starts to develop a deep emotional attachment to Guts, the first time putting the safety of someone else before his own ambition. So to briefly summarise, Casca likes Griffith, Griffith likes Guts, and unfortunately, Guts likes Casca, and oh, what a tangled web we weave. There's something so real and flawed about the way these characters relate to each other. Guts, Griffith, and Casca are great characters individually, but it's through their relationships they form with each other that we get to see who they really are as people. And quite frankly, that's some strong-ass character writing. And even in a world as massive and complicated as Berserk, it's the emotions and relationships of these people that drive the story forward. None of that, however, is to downplay what a magnificent job Mora has done in creating Berserk's world. The setting is heavily based off Western fantasy, with knights, princesses, and the occasional nightmarish monstrosity. The thing that really sets it apart for me, however, is Mora's ability to look beyond the typical and take influence from so many different cultures and folklore, creating a smorgasbord of a world that all at once feels deeply familiar, but totally alien. 
Fairies, minotaurs, ogres, giants, eastern deities, ghost pirates, it's all here. And every new encounter brings with it a fresh reimagining of a fantasy stable. Something as simple as a troll can through Berserk's lens become something entirely alien and frightening. Berserk also casts this same lens on the nature of humans. It treats the world of kings and knights much the same way George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones does, in that it deconstructs the idea of the good and chivalrous knight, reminding us that historically, a lot of these guys were in fact killing machines clad in silver and gold, committing atrocities in the name of the crown and honour. Make no mistake, the world of Berserk is a dark and cruel one, and one densely layered with all manner of broken people who are struggling to find their own place within it. Take for example the character of Silat. Silat starts out as a Kushan invader, and at first he's highly arrogant, believing his high aptitude for combat is completely unmatched by anyone in the Midland army, and he mocks their efforts to try and best him, only to later be soundly defeated by Guts. However, rather than becoming a kind of villain of the weak archetype, he learns from his experience, later swallowing his pride and telling his troops not to pursue Guts for the sake of their own safety. And as the story continues, more and more of the principles that Salat at first held so dear begin to fall away. And through this, he slowly grows and changes as a character, his place in the story ever evolving. Now admittedly, none of this is revolutionary storytelling, but the reason I pick a character as minor as Salat is that I could say the same for literally dozens of different characters from the world of Berserk. And each has at least the same amount of thought put into who they are as people and their shifting place in the story as things progress. Sometimes the insight into these characters is very small, such as the suggestion that perhaps Judo's feelings towards Casca may be a lot stronger than he's letting on, or very significant like the dual nature of Griffith's ambition. He is both once consigned to the fact that he'll do whatever he has to to achieve his goal, while also being deeply remorseful of the bodies he's left behind. All these aspects together make Berserk's world feel alive and dense. A lot of the time in media, it's easy to feel like the world is reforming around the main character's journey, but in Berserk, there's a real sense that the world at large is something that Guts and his companions must push through not something that will adjust to their whims. It's cold and it's unforgiving and it carries on regardless of their actions, and at the worst of times can feel incredibly nihilistic. Our heroes may save a town from fire, but meanwhile the world as a whole burns. Further emphasizing just how small a part of the world Guts actually is, is the manner in which the landscape of Berserk is constantly evolving. Without giving too much away, the world of Berserk has gone through three main phases, the Golden Age, the Eclipse Age, and the Fantasia Age. And with each new phase, everything about Berserk's world changes. Political and socioeconomic structures, massive scale global conflict, and even the laws that govern what is physically possible. Watching the world sway and evolve around Guts and his party really sells the idea that this is a huge, life-spanning journey they're on. It's also a world where good and evil are very much relative terms. There's no definitive light and dark in Berserk's world, except a thousand different perspectives on what good and evil can actually be defined as. Unfortunately, it's very difficult for me to get into why this is such an important part of Berserk's story without encroaching on some major spoilers. So if you want to avoid these, go to the time shown on screen now, or click the link in the description. Okay, we good? Let's do this. When I think of good and evil in Berserk's world, what comes to mind are images of Guts and Griffith. Guts, on one hand, looks nearly like a villain, especially the further into Berserk you get. Clad in black armour, missing an eye and an arm, and prone to intense bouts of violent rage, Guts' appearance is nearly demonic in nature. Griffith, on the other hand, is nearly the total opposite. His appearance, adorned in white and silver armour, is serene and beautiful. His design is nearly angelic. And for a lot of the early story, that's how he's depicted. Deeply beloved and enriching everyone's life around him. But of course, this is misleading. It's only later on when Griffith's true nature surfaces. After Guts' decision to leave the Band of Hawk, Griffith loses it, and for the first time in the story makes several very bad decisions that lead to him being imprisoned and tortured for the better part of a year. His body is now broken and ravaged, and that means that any hope he had of fulfilling his kingly ambition is now lost. 
And so he finally activates his Baelit, makes a deal with the God Hand, and in the process, sacrifices and kills every member of the Band of Hawk, with the exception of Guts and Casca. This is the catalyst for the quest of revenge that takes up the majority of Berserk's story, and at first this seems like a relatively simple revenge story setup. It's only later on when the lines begin to blur. You see, Griffith's transformation into Femto shows that he is, and to an extent always was, a being without empathy or humanity, a ruthless tyrant willing to sacrifice everything in order to achieve his goal. However, in doing so, he succeeds in uniting the world under one banner, even defeating the once thought invincible demon king Ganishka, and thus bringing the world to a new era of unification and peace. This complicates Guts's quest by some degree of magnitude. The deeds Griffith commits in order to gain power are abhorrently unforgivable, but when that power is used to end global conflict, the question becomes are small scale atrocities justifiable in the face of larger scale global peace? The good answer is no they are not, but you only need to open up a newspaper to see how relevant a question this still is today. On top of this, to the world at large, Griffith is essentially Anime Jesus 2.0, and Guts is nothing but a mad dog. If Guts does eventually take his revenge, will he be ending this era of peace, and if so, can that act really be considered good? These same themes are carried on through a lot of Berserk's visual design. One of the most interesting visual aspects of the series is the depiction of the many demons and otherworldly beings. Moore has spoken in interviews about how he takes a lot of influence from classical paintings depicting hell, but one painter in particular that stood out to me is the 15th century painter Bosch. Bosch became famous for his imaginative and horrifying painterly visions of hell, and the feeling you get from looking into one of his paintings is akin to peering into some kind of feverish nightmare, and these are the aspects that Mora draws upon, sometimes just tonally and occasionally even paying direct homage. There's something so frightening and alien about a lot of berserk supernatural beings, but where this ties back into the themes of light and dark is upon reading into berserk's lore. We realise that these creatures are not so much demons as angels, servants not of Satan, but of God. Many of the monsters from Berserk are humans who have made a deal with the God Hand and exchanged what is most valuable in their life for near infinite power. The fact that the God of Berserk's world carries out his will through such beings says not that that being itself is evil, but rather that the concept of good and evil simply do not apply to it, and by extension are not objective truths within the world of Berserk and it's up to each individual person to decide where the line of good and evil lies. So, with all this in mind, with as many different forms of Berserk as there now are, where should you start? Well, your three main options are the 1997 anime, the 2012 Golden Age movies, and the original manga. First off, let's discuss the two animated versions. After giving it some thought, the way I'd compare these two is that the anime is like listening to a band's entire back catalogue, while the movie is like listening to their greatest hits. In other words, the anime is going to give you a very solid grounding of the world and characters of Berserk, while the movies will cover less, but will get you there a lot quicker. And both have their strengths and weaknesses. I've seen a lot said about the 1997 anime, some people saying it looks flat out terrible, and some saying it hasn't aged a day, and I don't really feel that either of these are the case. What the 1997 anime is, is a show with very limited animation, saved completely by some absolutely stellar direction and stunning background art. It has a lot of cuts to save on overly elaborate animation, but they're always in the right place, always to the right shot. The soundtrack by Susumu Hurasawa is a total joy. I challenge you to listen to the track Forces and not get even a little pumped. I think out of the two, the anime also best captures the quiet moments I talked about earlier. And because it's a 24 episode series, we get more time to get to know the characters, and things like Guts's relationship with the Band of Hawk is much better fleshed out. There are scenes such as the first encounter with Nosferatu Zod that are far better done in this version. The strong art direction and bold lighting give this scene a horrific layer of dread and danger, which unfortunately is absent from the same scene in the 2012 film, mainly due to Zod's extremely rough character model. While this version of Berserk has definitely aged places, I still heartily recommend it, especially if you have any kind of place in your heart for that oh so delicious 90s anime aesthetic. The films tend to be a lot more divisive, but if you can push through some of the jankier 3D of the first movie, 
there's a huge spike in quality in the second and third. The 3D is used more wisely and is also mixed with some utterly fantastic 2D. On top of this, the action scenes of the films tend to hit a lot harder and are a lot more exciting than those of the 97 version. The limited animation of the 90s anime replaced with stunningly bombastic action scenes. The camera does a great job of selling the impact of each and every hit, and there's enough subtlety to the animation that you really feel the weight of every large impact. The larger scale battle scenes are also fantastic. Some of the advantages of 3D are really played up here and really convey the mass brutality and scope of the larger scale encounters. This is all backed up by some really terrific sound design. All the medieval armor and weaponry clicks and clacks with satisfying physicality. Some of the 3D models, especially those of the incidental characters, definitely feel like they could have used some more time in the oven. But the main cast for the most part look fantastic. I in particular love the design of Griffith. They really nailed his effeminate, otherworldly beauty. And to me, this combined with some really, really stunning shots later on, more than make up for the clumsy earlier 3D. And leaves a visual style that while not 100% consistent, is at times a goddamn gorgeous sight to behold. So really, if you want to pursue Berserk in animated form, you can't really go wrong with either of these options. But to really experience Berserk to its fullest, you need to read the manga. Not only because it's the only way to get 100% of Berserk's current up-to-date story, the vast majority of which remains unanimated, but also because in reading it, you're experiencing a complete master of the craft at work. The effort and passion that goes even into the smallest, most insignificant panel is incredible. Like, take this layout from one of the most recent chapters. Like, holy shit, look at the amount of drawing that went into this page. Every part is so detailed and there's so many little visual flourishes that I could honestly probably spend 20 minutes picking each little bit of it apart. But despite how busy it is, we never lose track of our characters because of how cleverly it's framed. And it's techniques like this that let Mora absolutely lavish his illustrations in detail while never breaking the flow of his compositions. Mora is excellent at conveying scenes of great violence and force, but He's also equally able to capture subtle moments of quiet beauty, this one page in particular being one of my all-time favourites in manga. I just feel like when you look at it, it's like all the pain and hardships of his journey are on display in this one quiet panel. Other than the fantastic expressive artwork, you also get the added bonus of watching an artist improve dramatically over the years. Moro is no slouch starting out but his skill has immensely improved since then, and with the manga still ongoing to this day, only continues to get stronger. There is also the 2016 version of Berserk, which I have already done a video on, and who boy did that make people mad. I'm currently up to date, and I can say that there has been a slight improvement over the course of its run, but for the most part, a lot of the problems I talked about in my original video still remain. And if I was to add anything else, it would be those crucial quiet moments I've talked about so much up till now are completely absent from this show. So, in terms of faults with Berserk, I'd have very few. A lot of people criticise the pacing, but I think this is more of a problem with the actual release schedule than the story itself. Rereading the infamously slow Guts on a Boat section is actually fine now that all the chapters are released and consumable. However, considering that it's still ongoing, you're left with the problem that when you do catch up, you'll have to suffer the slow drip feed of chapters with the rest of us. But look at it this way, which would you rather? Material that's rushed and of declining quality immediately, or a manga that's good eventually? See my video on the fall of Bleach for more on that topic. While I don't really feel that it's too major a fault, one thing I would say is that a lot of the fights in Berserk are not especially nuanced or tactical. Generally, it boils down to Guts getting super mad and slicing someone with a sword, but again, I feel like the focus of Berserk isn't really the fights as much as it might seem like it. It's the emotions behind them, and so that's why I can kind of give the fights a pass for going this way. And even then, a lot of the conclusions of the fights are pretty hype, so I can overlook it. One aspect I feel I do need to caution people about, however, is that there are a lot of very graphic depictions of sexual violence throughout Berserk. It's an aspect of the story that's considerably lessened over the years, but definitely in those early chapters it's pretty rampant. It's not like I don't think you can't cover this kind of material in media, you absolutely can. In fact, I think the way it's worked into Guts's backstory is extremely well done. But there is one instance towards the end of the Golden Age arc that is extremely graphic and very, very upsetting. And I wouldn't really feel right recommending this series without at least giving people a heads up about it. 
So if you are sensitive to this kind of material, then unfortunately this may be one to steer clear of. So it's probably obvious from a lot of things we've talked about, but bad things happen in Berserk. In fact, bad things happen a lot. Whether it's the overly controlling nature of a toxic relationship, or broader, more horrifying statements about the nihilistic nature of the universe. And so the question might become, what is the appeal of experiencing a story like Berserk? Well, to me, Guts is a character who has literally been to hell and back. He's seen humanity at its absolute worst and the damage that can do. He has repeatedly lost everything possible for a person to lose, and yet despite all this, he keeps going. He's wounded and he's broken and he's tired, but he still never loses the ability to put one foot in front of the other. His quest isn't just one of revenge, but also to find his place in the world. And even when that place is repeatedly destroyed, it doesn't stop him moving forward and relearning to trust people. This is why, despite all the nightmarish imagery and nihilistic themes, Berserk to me is a human story of hope and a person's ability to heal. And in this confusing and frightening age, I think that's the exact kind of story we need. And this, my friends, is why you should watch, slash read, Berserk.